in the scriptures, um, we're told that you really can't understand happiness unless you understand sadness. Mm -hmm. you, you don't understand pleasure if you don't know pain. It's, it's part of life, right. you know. And so can you learn something from somebody who's gone from success to success to success about how to be successful? I don't think so. <laughs> it has to be somebody who has failed and failed and succeeded and succeeded. How to Measure Your Life, uh, which I've read. What made you run to write this book? It's a very different book than your other books. Well, I always had wanted to help my students. So year after year, I've been at Harvard now for 20 years, we'd, sp we'd spend the whole semester working around how could you use Clay's research in how the business world really works mm -hmm. to help companies be more successful and to sustain their success. And then at the end of the class, I always wanted to help the students with personal advice in some ways. And so I began to do that and I gave them Clay's view of what they need to do to have a happy life. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think that I've, I've been very blessed personally, and if everybody did it like me, they'd be happy too, you know. <laughs> but it just didn't ever feel right. really right to right. me. And so one day, uh, maybe this was six years ago, mm -hmm. I said, look, I don't want to tell you what you should do because of what I did, but rather, let's take these models or theories from our research, which were developed to predict what companies will do if they do this, then that. Mm -hmm. And just put those things on like a set of lenses, but look at us instead. Right. And could those bodies of understanding really help us predict what we need to do in every individual circumstance to improve the profitability that the life ahead of us will be one of success and right. happiness. And uh, so we did that. And Oh my goodness, it was unbelievable what the students could see about themselves and their future by looking at it through these same lenses of things that we had developed for business. With all the usual challenges that they have, what kind of things we're talking about? Divorces or I, yeah. can't, I can't figure out what I want to do in life or yeah, so I, I need to kick the drugs or alcohol or what, what kind of stuff? I can guarantee you that none of our classmates planned in their life to go out and get divorced, to get their raised children who become inalienated with them, who they can't have access to. Mm -hmm. Nobody planned to end up in jail. But a stunning number of my classmates actually implemented a strategy that they didn't intend. They got divorced, one, two, Sometimes, many times, right. uh, Jeff Skilling end up in jail. That's not what he planned on. Right. And so, how can, what is it that, that causes you to implement something that you didn't intend to do? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that our research on disruption and the process by which uh, policy gets developed just had perfect application to how we should manage our lives. It's, I don't know, it sounds to me so cold and so rational to be taking business theory, management theory, and mapping it onto matters of the heart and the soul. Yeah, but it's, 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 not, it's not hard or cut and dried at all, but rather it's a way of thinking your way through a problem that actually brings warmth and happiness in, in a way that isn't cut and dried and analytical and business related. Rather. There's a way of th thinking your way through a problem right. to decide in a given situation what the outcomes are going to be if I do this for this. And you actually do that in your own life. You're married. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a choice to make about what you're going to do mm -hmm. with this evening, mm -hmm. you're going through that same logic. If I do this, what's going to happen? If I do this, this will, you know. and you may not know the answer of those things, but what we're trying to do is a process for thinking about it so that you have a better sense for 
what action will yield what kind of result. You had something in your book about what it takes to be a good husband or, sp or wife, spouse, uh, words like selflessness and sympathy. Uh, it wasn't protection and creating a good, uh, uh, secure household. It was more um, being, just being there. Can you talk about, a little about what it takes yeah. to be a good, to yeah. good, a good husband or wife? There is a theory from our research in marketing yeah. which is what causes people to want to buy something or pull it into their lives and, and what that is is you know stuff happens to us there are jobs that arise in our life that we need to get done mm -hmm. and understanding the job that the customer is trying to do is the, is, is the nugget because if you know what they're trying to get done then you can develop a product that will do the job perfectly and when you do that they pull it into their lives without coercion or without advertising or persuasion at all. And so if I imagine you are my wife and I come up with a product, meaning, and I know that my wife needs this product and I buy it for her or I do this for her and then she doesn't appreciate it and then I try to persuade her I, this is this is this is a good thing for you. Yeah. You know, it, it, you're in the same kind of a situation if a company develops a product that the customer doesn't want, and then they try to persuade them. What I really need to do is try to sit in exactly the same position, right. looking at a husband, and imagining what are the jobs that are arising in her life for which she might need a husband to provide that, to get that job mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, when I turn myself in the other way and, yeah. and get that sense, it turns out that I've been tr providing for her a lot of the things that are irrelevant to the jobs she needs to get done. Right. There's a whole chapter in the book about uh, outsourcing your kids to other people and letting other people uh, have that crack at giving them character and That's value, right. values. It is a huge issue, you know. Um, and it relates to corporate behavior too, of outsourcing. That, that's yeah. right. And b because the theory of outsourcing is that, geez, if, you can, if somebody can supply what you need at lower cost and higher quality than you can do it internally, yeah. you should outsource that. And so little by little, what Two generations ago, um, they raised a lot of their food. Even in suburbia, they did this, and mm -hmm. they they preserved it for the winter. And th the mothers made their clothing, and you just did a lot of work inside for your. You know, it was a busy place, and little by little, we outsourced all of those things to providers who can do it at higher quality and lower cost. And by outsourcing all of the work, really, there's what's left in a home these days is for our children to uh, pick up after themselves, which they don't do very well, no. and to play games, and and to ask the parents to drive them here and there, you know. And the the term uh, soccer mom yeah. wasn't in the English language 50 years ago. Whereas it used to be back then the children worked for the parents, now the parents work for the That's children. That's right. That's what it feels like. And it's, for whatever reason, I think this has hit <coughs> young men worse than young women. Boys, you mean boys? Yeah. yeah. But mm -hmm. when, when you get into the 20s, when historically you thought about marriage, a lot of women look at the man and, oh my gosh, this one is 26 years old chronologically. <laughs> But, but she's, he's really only 13 years old right. Right. with his perspective on life and his ability to, and that is, I mean, nobody would ever marry a 13 year old. Right. And, and that's the problem. But, but you were saying in the book that there's many things that we're doing for our kids that they come away having thought was the most important thing that to us was meaningless. That yes. And we, we'll talk about that. Talk about what happens in those dynamics. Yeah. So, Others have done this, but we do it too. When now our kids are largely raised, 
But when they come back home and we listen to them banter back and forth about the experiences when they were younger that really shaped their view of God and life and the purpose of life, Chris and I have very few memories of those experiences. And then we ask, when we ask the kids, well, do you remember when we sat you down and taught you the, the truths of eternity? Right. And they have no memory of any of those experiences. <laughs> and, and the insight is that children will learn when they're ready to learn, not when we're ready to teach them. Right. And it actually is true. Corporations will learn when they're ready to learn, not when we're ready to teach them. You know? right. But if you know that, that you can't predict when the children are learning from you, oh my goodness, what that means is we better be living a life so that whenever we find ourselves in a mode where they're learning from us, right. we better be, we better be Around. found <laughs> yeah. to be doing what yeah. they want to learn and not something that we wish they didn't learn.